Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm honored to have with me David Levinson, who's the president and CEO of Loma, Limra, and LL Global. Uh, we're going to discuss a wide range of topics. Uh, Dave, you know, thank you for joining us. JC, my pleasure. Great to be here. Can you give a little background on yourself and also, you know, the the uh, entities that you're working for and kind of the, the work that you're doing for those probably three people that don't know what you're what you've been doing? <laughs> sure, I, I appreciate that. So, so JC, this is um, I joined LL Global in uh, 2019 at the beginning. It's my first experience with um, working directly for a trade association. So most of my career. Uh, was with uh, the Hartford in the insurance industry, where at the end I ran Hartford Life. Uh, and then I spent six years of my career on the distribution side with Edward Jones. So um, wonderful opportunity came back at the right point in my career to give back to the industry. And uh, in 2019, as I mentioned, I moved over. So uh, Limra um, and Loma are just brands under the LL Global Legal Entity. Uh, some of you are familiar with Limra, which is more on the research side, and some of you are familiar with Loma, which is more on the education side. Um, but Limra traces its roots to 1916. Uh, so we're 105 years old. We are a, uh, a nonprofit trade association. We're different from a lot of the other trade associations in that we don't do any advocacy work. Our focus is really on uh, developing knowledge, insights, uh, connections, and solutions for the industry. Uh, thank you for that background, Dave. I really appreciate it. And uh, I think it lets our viewers know that you're equipped to give some insights into these topics, because I know you've done a lot of research on some of them, and just your personal views on some issues would be appreciated as well. So let's, uh, let's start with talking about the growth in the life, and life insurance industry. You know, the, the uh, LIMRA survey that just came out showed that in the first quarter of 2021, there's a 15% growth in premium and 11% growth in policy sold, which is really historic levels. We haven't seen this since the early 80s when Universal, Universal Life came out. Can you give some insight into what's driving that growth? Yeah, and JC, just for context, because uh, when, you, when you hear a double-digit growth number, small double-digit growth, Relative to other industries like in Amazon, it may not seem like a lot, but uh, for context, the last time our industry grew by 4% or more in a quarter was 1983. So this is a 40-year high, if you will, uh, in terms of policy growth in our industry. So clearly we're in the midst of a pandemic. Um, you know, the research that we did uh, in the fall of 2020 suggested that 31% of uh, Americans would buy insurance because of the pandemic. So we saw a surge in demand. Uh, I mean, it was hard to go anywhere without uh, seeing a, uh, a news program or something about the pandemic. And I think that just caused everybody to reevaluate whether or not they had the appropriate amount of financial security, whether they had insurance at all, or whether they had the right level of insurance. And I think both of those uh, have certainly contributed to the surge in growth over the last, I'd call it uh, 12 months. And it seems to be continuing as we uh, go through 2021. Yeah, that, that certainly seems like a motivating factor for a lot of people in seeking insurance. So I, it's obviously it's, it's impossible to sustain historic levels of growth, but how does the insurance industry, do you have any thoughts on what the industry can do to continue growth at a, at a decent pace as we've, we have struggled as an industry to have uh, significant growth, as you said, you know, 3% levels, 2% flat or declining at times. Uh, any thoughts on you know, what we could do to continue uh, sustained growth? I, I think there are two data points here that I can share. One is, um, you know, as we've tracked life insurance ownership in the United States, today, 52% of adults uh, own life insurance. Uh, that's the lowest since we've started doing our tracking, and that our tracking goes back several decades. So um, the trend line isn't wonderful, but again, we're seeing a, a surge in demand, and and hopefully we've seen a plateau. So with all the fintechs and all the new approaches to distribution, I'm hopeful and optimistic we'll find a way to get to that 48% that doesn't have insurance 
uh, and uh, the other chunk of the population, candidly, of that 52% that doesn't have enough insurance. So that'd be data point one. Data point two uh, would be we don't we don't come across these pandemics very often, as you know, right? But you go back to 1918, 1919, the Spanish flu, and we saw that the demand for life insurance products continued for about three to five years. So there's no reason to think that it won't continue um, for the next three to five years. I think it's really up to us on the supply side, the carrier side, the distributor side, the agent side to make sure that we are uh, keeping this top of mind with our clients. I mean, any insights into uh, the younger ages? Have we made progress there and appealing to uh, the, the younger group? Yeah, I, I think the younger group is certainly an opportunity. So uh, if you just look at our research and think about the millennial population, uh, they will say 49 percent of them will say they are looking to purchase insurance in the next 12 months. Forty nine percent. I mean, that's pretty incredible. Um, so they're savvier in terms of the technology. Uh, we've seen a surge in terms of uh, direct to consumer, the direct to consumer channel uh, during the pandemic. I think that's largely driven by millennials. Uh, but I think the industry has an enormous opportunity uh, to tap into that age segment, especially given the fact that a lot of them are just uh, starting out families. And as you know, protection is one of the most important things that uh, a new family could have, especially for the, uh, the breadwinner. Yeah, that's a good segue into the next topic I'd like to cover, and that's kind of the the digitization and streamlining of underwriting, and then maybe a little bit around InsureTech, which you just mentioned, and, and how that's going to impact the industry. Obviously, during the early stages of the pandemic in particular, life insurance companies were reevaluating how they underwrite business, given that much of the data that they used in traditional underwriting process was not available. Uh, so they look to streamline underwriting to get policies issued um, and, and discussions around digitization and the need for that was becoming more apparent as you didn't have companies, people in the home office processing paper applications. There's this need to digitize more. Uh, so do you, do you think you know now that we're back in a situation where that data is available to insurance companies, do you think this trend will continue and look to digitize and streamline underwriting? Or are we going to fall back to our old ways, which I think uh, is kind of a natural tendency to go back to the way we did things before and just utilize the same data and go through the, the same process? A any thoughts on what you're seeing or what you're hearing? Yeah. So, you know, JC, it's pretty, pretty incredible when you think about how how face to face oriented our industry is and has been, right? The fact that we're coming across these growth rates that you mentioned a little bit earlier, I mean, pretty spectacular uh, when you kind of put that in perspective regarding the way we used to work and have been working. Um, so based on some of our research, we know that 80% uh, of our member companies um, have used or are using uh, uh, automated, uh, some type of automated underwriting, simplified underwriting. We also know from our survey that 80% said that they would continue this. My guess is that both of those numbers are low. So we have a more robust study that will be coming out in the next several months that will talk a little bit more about um, how many companies, how many policies are actually going through automated underwriting. But I, I think to some extent, maybe this is the silver lining of the pandemic, uh, we've known for a while that our industry needs to adjust and uh, think about creating a much more Amazon-like experience for customers. Um, we can only do that through analytics um, and to, through, through tools like automated underwriting. Um, so this was the silver lining. This is the catalyst that uh, by necessity we had to create and we had to expand and I think a lot of our companies and our members are very pleased with how they performed here. And as I talk to our members, uh, I am hearing more about investing more and more into these new technologies as opposed to retreating. So uh, I think this is uh, here to stay at this point. Uh, do, do you see any particular sources or, or types of data that are 
uh, being considered by insurance companies that are that are new? Yeah, so I'm not sure, JC, if we're seeing new things as much as we are seeing um, different ways to pull together things like medical records in a more efficient manner. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of fintechs that are in this space right now trying to make it simple. Uh, obviously, MIB plays a very important role here as well. So there's just a lot more attention and capital going into this part of the industry. And I think that's a good thing because, uh, you know, usually when capital goes into uh, new types of innovation, good things happen. Yeah, but I agree with that. I think medical records are uh, one of the keys to the future and digitizing that. We've got some partnerships that uh, we have in place that are focusing on that. So uh, I, I, I see that trend continuing as well. How about uh, the role you mentioned in SureTech before and the role that they would play in accelerating this digitization and streamlining of underwriting and then also you know, improving access to those markets that we haven't gotten to? What what, what, what do you see? Anything interesting going on there? Well, I think there's a lot of interesting things. Uh, so there, there are so many insure tech firms that are out there. They're all trying to uh, find ways to essentially address some of the inefficiencies, I would say, of our industry. And, you know, two things. One is that creates a little bit of pressure, perhaps, for the traditional players, but it also creates partnership opportunities. Um, so... You know, when I think about these insure techs, they're very creative. They're very technologically savvy. Um, I think the downside is they may not know our industry super well. They may not know and understand uh, things like the compliance regime as effectively as they probably need to. But to the extent that they can partner with a lot of the traditional carriers, again, I think that's where we're going to start seeing a lot of innovation in our industry. Yeah, I'd agree. I think it's a great opportunity to partner uh, it is challenging for a startup company to deal with all the compliance issues and policyholder service and everything that goes with that. With the regulatory system we have, it certainly would be a challenge to enter. So uh, it's a great opportunity to leverage the strength of partners. We've done a little bit of that with uh, Bear Risk and Human API, and I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to partner and look outside of doing things ourselves, which traditionally we've done. So I, I, I agree with those comments, agree. yeah. So another kind of a continuing along that line of technology, you know, the uh, Limerick just recently did a global executive survey where uh, the the technology moved to the top of the list as kind of concerns for global executives. And you know, technology is a really broad term. And I was wondering if you could give some more insight into specifically what what tech, technology issues are, are of concern to the global executives. Yeah, so I think this uh, this answer came up uh, with about 80% of the executives surveyed. So, you know, it wasn't from 51% or 40%. I mean, this is a this is a core issue. And, you know, again, as as our industry tries to evolve to a different world, right, where the Amazons and the uh, the Googles uh, and the Apples are, have, have such an important role. Um, I think part of this is how does our industry use technology and catch up with these other platforms? And again, maybe there's partnership opportunities, maybe there's innovation, maybe there's a lot of other things like that. Um, the other item that tends to come up a lot with uh, some of our traditional carriers as we talk about technology is legacy systems. And as you know, um, you know some of our companies were built from acquisition or different lines of business and bringing that all together in a seamless way for customers has been a little bit of a challenge. So we're seeing a lot more investment today in trying to address legacy systems because people feel like it is a constraint for how quickly they might be able to grow their business and ultimately take care of clients. Yeah, that that is a big issue and has been for the insurance industry for a long time. And Hopefully, technology will provide some solutions to help deal with the legacy issues and help companies transition into uh, into the future. Yeah, let, let's discuss the underinsured U.S. market a little bit. You know, it's 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 interesting. I 
I, I just was cleaning out my desk because you come back into work after uh, working from home a long time. You realize everything that's in your drawers you really don't need anymore. <laughs> and I was going through my drawers cleaning stuff out and I came across the 2004 article that uh, research paper that Limra did on uh, titled The Trillion Dollar Baby. And it's uh, about the sales potential of the uninsured uh, people in, in the U.S. market. And I think how much that's been a conversation piece throughout the 15 plus years since that, that article has been written, people still refer back to that. And I think it's a testament to the fact that we haven't really made a lot of progress in addressing this really important issue of people that, that either don't have access to insurance or don't know how to go through the process. So it's, it's really our responsibility to reach those people. And we, we, we've been failing for a long time. I know Limra is doing some really good work around this, and I, uh, you know, I wonder if you could share your thoughts on what we need to do, and then kind of your work and how that ties into helping the industry address this really important issue. Yeah. So, um, you know, JC, I talked about this at our annual conference uh, in 2020, um, and you know, obviously, it doesn't go away. So, when you look at our industry, there's about 25 trillion dollars of life insurance in force. Um, so it's a very significant number. Um, when you think about the size of the uninsured and the underinsured market, they collectively represent about $13 trillion of opportunity. So when you think about where we're spending our time as an industry, um, again, we get we get very used to the traditional ways of doing business and the traditional ways of, of growing our business. But if there were different ways, again, whether through insure tax or different channels or different investments, that we can really spend some time thinking about uh, how to get to that uh, uninsured and underinsured population, it grows our balance sheet by 50%, five zero not our sales number, our balance sheet. So it's an incredible opportunity for the industry, but as important, if not more important, when you think about the good that we do with the, the customers and the, the individuals, the Americans that we help with our, with our solutions, we're really helping people that need our help and support um, by trying to do, you know, by trying to address the, underinsured and uninsured marketplace. So we know, for example, JC, that 25% uh, of households in the United States uh, would realize financial difficulty in one month if the primary breadwinner were to pass prematurely, and 42% within six months. So when you think about growing our industry, we're growing it for a very good purpose, which is really to protect more people. And that should feel good to all of us. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I know it's a mission that the ACLI is taking on more seriously and your work to support that. Uh, what what else, you know, can the industry do? Like I said, when this, this is really something that was identified, and I guess in a very significant way and with Limra in 2004, and here we are today, you know, what, what do you think insurance companies can do to, to help, well, one, help, deal with this really important issue of uninsured people, like you say, it won't be long you know, after this breadwinner passes that they won't have the funds to continue. Um, so addressing that issue, but then also opportunity, you know, obviously there's there uh, for the industry. What, what do you think insurance companies need to do? Yeah, so, so look, we, we just talked about uh, how effective the industry was during the pandemic, right? And how, how well the industry transitioned with things like automated uh, underwriting. Um, I don't think it's anything more challenging than focus. Uh, so I really do believe that if our industry invested more in this opportunity, if our industry focused more on this opportunity, uh, we will see the coverage gap continue to shrink in the United States. And again, there's so many ways to do it. You can do it through the work site. You can do it through direct to consumer. You can do it through the 330,000 life licensed financial professionals. But it's got to be an int intentional focus. 
And as I uh, speak to more folks on the distribution side, as I speak to more folks on the carrier side, I do get a sense that especially with the pandemic, uh, the focus on the middle market where the need is the greatest, I think, um, uh, is getting a lot more attention today than it ever has in the past. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about the engagement model. And, and this is really connected to, to what I think what we just talked about. There's not a lot of you know, research, and this is probably more personal conversation and, and insights as opposed to data supporting what, what, what we're about to say. But you know, it seems like there's opportunity here. The traditional model for engagement is uh, you know, to sell, really focused on selling a life insurance policy. And then once the policy is sold, kind of walk away and not have any kind of continuous engagement with policyholders. Do you think there's opportunity here you know, to address kind of the issue we talked about before, also help uh, increase the, improve the perception of life insurance in the industry with, with a more continuous engagement process? Yeah, that's a great question, JC. So um, I guess I'll share a couple things. So the answer to that is yes. Um, I think uh, it's important. I actually think it's critical. And we're seeing a lot of innovation um, from uh, a few carriers in, 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 in particular, not, not widespread quite yet, but there are a few carriers that have added um, programs uh, onto their insurance platform that enable them to interact with their customers multiple times a day, multiple times an hour um, through devices like Apple Watches and other things, and to provide uh, incentives for things like good health, which help the insured and also help the insurer. So again, wonderful alignment. I'd love to see more of that uh, in our industry. Um, and then the other thing which you know I'll bring up and some may think that it's a third rail, but I, I don't, it's just you know compensation structure. Um, and there's a lot of people that would say, if you wanna know what to do today or tomorrow, look at your incentive compensation and it will tell you what to do today and tomorrow. And our, our industry compensation to a large extent is skewed toward uh, the acquisition and not so much the servicing. And candidly, that's the way it worked in the mutual fund industry for a long time. Um, but now when you go to the mutual fund industry, it's less commission-based and more fee-based. And I, you know, I don't know what the analog will be for the insurance industry, but um, I think there's a lot of work we can do to make it almost as important to uh, visit with customers, maintain relationships as it is to just uh, help the uh, help the client acquire the policy. That's a very good point. I think tying those two things together to incentivize you know, distribution to continue to engage and then you know, companies directly uh, engaging with policy. I know, you know some of the companies you're talking about that are that are doing some work. I, I always like Brooks Tingle's comment at uh, John Hancock, you know, the perfect alignment between the policyholder and, and the insurance company, life insurance company, they they both are invested in the in the health and well being of the policyholder. And we should do things to help support that. I mean, Mike DeConing, I heard a, a, a little video clip on LinkedIn that he was talking about this issue of engagement. But I, I kind of feel like it's it's not really taking getting a lot of traction in the industry. And I, I'm just curious, do, do you know why it's it's not you know, really moving forward in any kind of meaningful way? Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I do think uh, some may not uh, see the benefit, right? Because, you know, it's expensive to invest in a lot of these programs and platforms. But um, from, every, from everything we can tell, you know, again, it more than pays for itself, but uh, importantly, gives the insurance carrier a lot of data, uh, encourages the insured to get healthier. And, you know, as you said with Brooks, it creates a perfect alignment between the insured and the carrier. And um, so I, I'd like to think that, you know, maybe a few of the companies you mentioned are early, uh, but I think they've been out there for enough time now that uh, I'm going to guess we're going to start seeing a lot more of this in the next five years for sure. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. I think it's a it's a great opportunity on many levels that I think uh, 
makes you know not only sense in terms of image but financial sense too as you mentioned you know if we invest in engaging with policyholders and give them tools to help them manage their health and well-being you know where we all benefit from that including you know, the policyholder and all, all the insurance companies so I, i'm i'm hopeful too that that'll get a little bit more traction going forward so let's just you know, kind of in closing here, our last topic where, you know, you can't have a webinar without talking about, uh, you know, the pandemic in, in, in a more yeah. deeper way. But I know you've done a lot of research. I know we, we have as well in tracking the pandemic and the impact of it and kind of groups that are, are, are impacted more than others. And so just kind of thoughts on lessons learned and what we should think about as we're hopefully emerging hopefully will emerge from this pandemic and moving forward. What are what are kind of the, the insights into your research that your research has provided? Yeah, so I appreciate that question, JC. You know, one of the things I'm, I'm very, very um, pleased about is, you know, when we when we discovered the statistic uh, through our research that 31 uh, percent of Americans would uh, buy insurance or buy more insurance because of the pandemic. Um, we just didn't publish a research report. We actually uh, worked with seven other trade associations, ultimately became uh, over 75 companies, the largest companies in the United States. And we created a help protect uh, our families campaign. And what we did, I think we're on our 38th week of providing resources to the industry um, and social media, et cetera. And it has been so good to see our industry come together at such a critical time. So you ask about the lesson learned. Um, I know in many ways uh, we compete with one another as companies, uh, but there are times uh, certainly when I think it is certainly valuable for our industry to work together and come together. And I think by working together and coming together, uh, we can shape uh, the ultimate, uh, we, 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 can, we can shape the ultimate results for the, for the end consumer, which is, again, what, what it is that we're trying to accomplish here. So uh, to me, the big aha is, um, you know, very pleased that we as a trade association have been able to bring together the, uh, bring together the industry and by doing so, I, I'd like to think in some small way, have uh, helped uh, our industry meet the meet the demand of the marketplace, and you know lead to these forty year high results. Thanks for thanks for those thoughts, Dave. I really appreciate that. And uh, hey, thank you for joining me today in this conversation. I've I really appreciate it. Really enjoy it. And also for all the great work that uh, you know, LL Global does in terms of research and education. You know, it's a, a great trade association that really helps forward the industry in, in many ways. So I really appreciate that. And uh, I look forward to hopefully seeing you sometime in person soon. Absolutely, JC. Thanks again for the opportunity and great to work with you and the SCORE team. All right, thanks, Dave.